Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Rappin' with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Burkelhammer, and today I welcome Moki Chow, also known as the Inappropriate Reefer. He has a huge following on Instagram and YouTube, and I personally think his content um, is awesome. He does a fantastic job chronicling his reef keeping journey via those platforms. Moki, man, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have you on. Keith, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've been following your journey. I know you got a new build coming up, and um, the dimension looks amazing. Looking forward to chatting with you. Yeah, now listen, it's um, it's always exciting to do a to do a new tank build, and and you've um, we were just talking before the show. You had a forty five gallon tank, and and I guess it was um, kind of busting some seams or whatnot, and you and you had to uh, pivot with the with a new tank. So we're gonna we're gonna talk all about that. You were so kind enough to uh, shoot some video of your tanks. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna play those videos and and you you narrate during those um, tank tours, but then we're gonna kind of come back and talk about it. So, folks, um, this is a real treat to have Moki on the show here, and and um, please feel free to ask your questions. We're gonna do a lot of uh, I have a lot of questions myself, so we'll um, we'll kind of start with some of my questions, and we'll do a little uh, moderating in terms of what uh, questions are coming from the audience. But uh, you know, bit of a juggling act, right, Moki? Just uh, figure it out as we go along yep let's do it let's hang out all right man so um first and foremost hopefully you and your family are okay with all the craziness going on with with COVID-19 how's uh how's everybody coping with that uh, we're getting a little cabin fever um my wife and I are used to kind of travel a lot especially since uh, she came from Hong Kong so she's it's just like a springboard away from all these great countries in Southeast Asia um, but with COVID here, we've been kind of like staying home for the last half a year. So we're coping. Um, for my end, I fare a little bit better since I got like reef tanks behind me I can work on at home. We got a small yard and we can uh, do a little planting and stuff like that. But uh, she's been itching to travel. Uh, but also, fortunately, we do have a uh, newborn. Well, not newborn anymore. It's nine months now to keep us uh, a little busy and occupied. So we've, we've been all right. We've been blessed. How about you guys? Good. You know, everything is good. I, I live in uh, Vermont and, um, you know, knock on wood, things are uh, pretty good in terms of, you know, the, the amount of um, folks that have, have COVID. But, um, geez, you know, the area that I live in is a, uh, is a kind of a, um, a vacation area. Second homeowners come a lot from, from Massachusetts and, and New York. So when this whole thing started out with COVID, it was a little scary because we had a lot of people kind of fleeing the big cities of Boston and New York to come to Vermont. That's a safe mm. haven, and um, you know it was a little nerve wracking, but uh, you know a lot of those folks are still here, so it's um, you know it's it's tough, it's trying times, but like as as you said, for us that uh, us folks that have reef tanks and what have you, it's it's kind of like a nice thing to be able to lean on in terms of a hobby like that, and and um, so that's a good thing. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I feel like there are more people going coming into the hobby now, and um, business has actually been. Sometimes, dare I say, like even better for like coral vendors and stuff. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I've been pretty busy. So um, yeah, no, for sure. All right, so Moki, I always like to start off each show with my guests and ask them a question in terms of how they got into this uh, great hobby of ours. So um, what's what's your story there, Moki, in terms of how you got into this reef keeping hobby? I just start. I'll try to like shorten it as much as possible. Um, years ago, when I was still in Hong Kong, I was like probably like 10 or 11 years old. Uh, one of the, uh, my favorite pastime is actually going to this place called the Goldfish Street in Hong Kong with my grandma. It's almost, it's like, it's almost every weekend we'll go there, we'll hang out and then we'll hop next, next street is like called Bird Street. And it is just exactly what it sounds. It's a whole street full of like aquarium stores, a whole street for, uh, full of like pet stores. And to this day, it's still there. When I go back to Hong Kong, I like to visit there. So I started from there. And uh, like a lot of people, I started with freshwater uh, aquariums. Now, fast forward to me after I moved to the U.S. when I was like probably like 15, 16 years old, I stepped foot in an aquarium thinking that I'll start another freshwater tank with a friend. And as soon as we walk in, we saw just kind of like a whole wall full of like little nano tanks. And in one of these nano tanks, there's this little bicolor blenny that was perching inside a sea urchin shell. Uh, like a sea urchin died and just like an empty little shell. It just perched there. And I was super fascinated. And from there, I talked to my friend. I was like, since we're starting from scratch, why don't we just try our hands at like a reef tank? This was probably 15 or 16 years ago. Uh, we have 
okay success. I mean, we're keeping like really simple stuff. Uh, I started out with like a 30 gallon tank, no sump. It's basically a big fish bowl using tap water because I did not know any better. And I thought that was how reef keeping was. And then I discovered my local reef club and I, I slowly progress in this hobby a little bit. Uh, but from there, just kind of snowboard. Um, from there, I went to college. Uh, I, start, I got into like a 10 gallon tank or nano tank for the dorm room. And then I moved back home, upgrade a little bit, went with like a 65 gallon tank and then lost everything in like a power outage of five days. Got out of the hobby for a couple of years. And then later on, I came back with the 45 gallon tank that I bought third hand actually from somebody local. And uh, at that point was when I thought, hey, maybe I'll start documenting um, the journey with a specific YouTube channel just for that tank. Before that, I put up like random videos in my regular YouTube channel, which is kind of like a catch all. And I would call myself the quote unquote inappropriate reefer because I still use tap water, which I know is not is like a no no. And I do some questionable stuff like uh, I had to tang in a uh, 65 gallons, actually not too bad, but I, I did that as well. But because of all these things that was kind of, quote unquote, against the grain, I just call myself in an appropriate refurb dash and then the topic of the video. So when I came about, when it come time to create a new channel, I thought, okay, I'll just carry this over and just call it the inappropriate refer. So that's kind of like the, uh, I thought it was going to be short, but it's actually kind of a long-winded story of how I got started. So, yeah, you know, you've, you already uh, kind of answered a couple other uh, questions of mine. One was like, how, how did you come up with the, the inappropriate refer um, um, name? But uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. So um, for, for those that, that don't uh, follow your content on YouTube and Instagram, and there's not many out there that don't, <laughs> explain to them what, um, what your content's all about. You know, what's, what's the uh, kind of mission of your channel and uh, Instagram account? Yeah, sure. Um, so it pretty much, it's, it's really just kind of like following my journey as a hobbyist. Um, once in a while, I may do like a DIY or like sharing my experience on certain equipments or products. But for the most part, I want to approach it as kind of like, uh, oh, this is what I'm doing right now. Like, check it out. If I make some mistake, which I sometimes and often do, uh, just don't do the same thing. Or like, oftentimes I use my social media kind of like a personal bulletin board. If I have questions. For example, like um, what's the best way to, uh, well, there's some really good example recently. Like how do I properly grow a red mangrove tree? Or like what kind of macro algae should I attempt and stuff like that. If I have a question like that, sometimes I'll post it, especially on my Instagram because I get more immediate feedback. Um, so I kind of use it that way. Uh, I feel like in terms of contents, at least like from my perspective, I see there are like two different types in terms of a channel and stuff like that. One side is more towards informational, right? These are the people that know what's going on. They put out like fantastic content. The other side is more towards like entertainment. This is kind of like, oh, people are interested in this hobby. They just want to like relax, sip some tea and just enjoy and make them feel like they own a part of your tank as well. So I'm leaning way more towards the entertainment side, especially because I know so many people that are so much further advanced in this hobby than I am. So I'm really afraid to put out like bad information. I only share things that I'm pretty certain or if I can like pull them in and have them share it. So uh, that's kind of like my goal in terms of social media. I think another part that I really want to do is that because I know so many people put out fantastic content that is not reaching all the people that they should be reaching. I try to help them bubble up to the top because I feel like uh, these fantastic fantastic contents uh, deserve to be seen and should be seen. Not so much, not just to help fellow hobbyists, but also to help the animals as well. You know, the less things we kill, I think it's just better for everybody and all the, all the critters. So that's kind of like uh, my thought behind social media at this point. Why do you think you've... Um you know, garnered such a big following. Why, why, why are, you know, do you have so many Instagram followers and, and a large, um, you know, base of YouTube subscribers? What do you think it is? I mean, are, are you, you think it's just, you're just being genuine and, and that, that's kind of um, speaking to a lot of people? You know, to be honest, I like, it doesn't, it hasn't really quite hit me. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but like it's every single time uh, I post my look at numbers, I was like, oh, okay. Like it doesn't quite hit me yet. I feel like maybe people like the approach of uh, somebody who's not perfect. Like, I know I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be. Um, they like the approach that somebody don't claim that they know everything, uh, which I don't. And they, they enjoy that. It's kind of like just watching a friend kind of be in this hobby together with them. And I, I think, like, uh, a lot of people see me as a friend, which they should. I'm guessing that may be it, to be honest. But to this day, I'm still kind of like, okay. Well, I'll tell you, it, um, you know, as a fellow YouTuber, let me, uh, let me say that, um, 
it's it's tough to create content and to come up with content um, on a weekly basis. You know, it's it's not easy. Depending on the types of videos that you do, it um, there's a lot of work involved. And um, you know, but I I think you know your kind of style in terms of I think you described it to me before we um, uh, got on the show. It's like a run and gun type of style, and and you're just kind of um, letting uh, you know going free form and and kind of talking about what's going through your mind and, and, and just relating your experiences to, to the viewers, which I think is just an extremely effective way to do it. And, you know, also it, it, um, it makes it less, less work if you can do it that way, because you don't have oh, to yeah. sit there and do a lot of editing. <laughs> Keith, I think you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, in the past, I've tried different, different, uh, different style. I'll say I've tried a style where I would have like beautiful B rolls and uh, like edit to the music and pick like really specific music and stuff like that. Oh man, that was a lot of work. And I mean, when I have time, I enjoy it a lot. I'll do it. But when I don't have as much time, it's hard to keep to that consistent, consistent quality that I would like if I can do something more cinematic. And I find that it became a chore. And in comparison, I've done some in the past where I just straight up vlog. Uh, I just kind of like film whatever I'm talking about yep. uh, versus having a voiceover afterwards. It's just so much easier. And now it comes to a point where that I know that, okay, this is happening. Let me just vlog that section. I don't overdo it. Uh, there, there have been times where I would go travel to a new place and I'll just film everything. But when I came back, I did not even want to edit because it's so much footage to yeah. kind of sort through. Like the first, I think it's like first Magna. I went to also the first and second like Reef Palooza. I just came home with so much footage. I it was it was not fun. At that point, I'm just like oh, I don't know. <laughs> and let me tell you, um, me and my wife went to Philippines. We got some beautiful, beautiful footage of the natural reefs, and we went star calling, diving, and just a lot of a lot of adventures there. I have not edited the videos yet because it's just so much to go through. Every time I thought about it, I'm like. Oh. No. Yeah. No. It's so you, you hit the uh, you hit the nail right on the head. It's it is a lot of work, but uh, you know. So I'm talking about traveling, you mentioned a uh, a trip to Hong Kong and these uh, fish stores. I remember seeing that video you put out, and and that was just to me uh, such a really cool video. And I think you mentioned that there were um, some two hundred and fifty dollar gem tangs in in one of those uh, markets or stores or what have you. But um, that was pretty neat. I mean. Talk about your, your travels and all that stuff in, in terms of where you've gone and, and how you've incorporated that stuff, you know, within your, uh, your content. And, you know, you, you also did mention that you, you go to uh, some of these trade shows and, and document content as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, just speak to the travel a little bit and, and how you're um, incorporating that into YouTube and Instagram. Sure. Well, Keith, I am not a... Uh traveler i'm not a jet setter like at least like not in my personality but my wife is and back then i was dating her or pursuing her so she likes to travel <laughs> and she's in hong kong i was like all right well let's do it so i figured like to make it a little bit more fun i was like why don't like since i'm there already why don't i check out like the different aquarium stores or like public aquarium just to see like what the difference is and stuff like that and as i started looking a little bit more into it it's uh it's really interesting even like in hong kong where i have been to that fish street like pretty much weekly when I grew up there. Wow. But it just that after I started getting more into the aquarium hobby, a saltwater aquarium hobby, when I went back, it I just like a totally different perspective. It was like a treasure trove. It was amazing. <laughs> and there's um a lot of concepts like how they approach uh, reef keepings and like the I guess like it's kind of bad to say, but like the way they they I guess like they see animals is different. It's a it's whole a different, different perspective, culture. Yeah. It's a different perspective for sure. Uh, so it takes a little getting used to, but once you step in the shoe and kind of see it from their perspective as well, it, it makes sense. It's like, okay, all right, I see that. Uh, but it kind of opened my eyes a lot. And it, I feel like I have a more complete sense of like seeing how things get to where we are, like in terms of like equipment, a lot of them come from Asia. Um, and that kind of ties into trade show as well. Uh, by going to trade show, and probably because I have an audience, uh, I, I was able to talk a lot more to some of these manufacturers and stuff like that. And I can kind of see um, like the other side of things as well, like fish stores, uh, equipment manufacturers, the challenges they have, and like what they're trying to do. I mean, everybody want to do the right thing for the hobby. Nobody's like being want to be a bad guy, but it just kind of like there may be some like conflicting views of what is right and what is wrong, and it's, it's interesting. It's interesting, and um, kind of opened up my mind as well a little bit as well. Well, I'll tell you, the, uh, it's, it's mind-boggling to me in terms of the Hong Kong uh, fish market, in terms of the volume of livestock that they, they mm -hmm. have, and I guess that they go through on a daily basis. So obviously, people are uh, really passionate 
about the uh, about the hobby over there. Absolutely, absolutely. I think like one thing that a lot of people pointed out as a uh, mind boggling is uh, the pre bagged fish. Yes, that's hung on the wall, right? Yeah. But those actually, it's uh, they they move the fish inventory so fast that it was it was not really a big concern. And the ones that don't get sold, they get rebagged uh, at night. And that's something that people don't normally see. It's got to be a lot of work. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah, it is. Totally. All right. So, so Moki, at the beginning of the show, I mentioned that you were um, so kind to shoot some video of your tanks, and and so we've got um, we've got one of your 145 gallon tank, and then we've got another of your 17 gallon nano. You call it a like a macro macro mangrove tank, nano tank. Yep. So uh, maybe we'll start with the 145 gallon tank, and this is about a five minute clip, and and you narrate over this. So when when we're done looking at this, we'll come back and we'll, uh, we'll chat some more about it. And, uh, yeah, folks, if you have any questions, then feel free to post them in the comments section. But let's, uh, let's go to the uh, videotape. Sounds good. Hey, Keith. Once again, thank you for letting me be a part of uh, your live stream. It is an honor. Today we're going to do a quick snapshot of this 145 gallon tank. I'm happy to dive into any of these components during the live stream uh, if needed. So this tank, it's about five months at this point and it is very much in its ugly phase. Uh, I'm pretty bad in terms of cycling so I'll cycle with the light on. It's just something that I do. It's kind of weird. I like seeing algae grill. Kind of give me an indicator of which stage of cycling it is in. Uh, so as a result, I do have some brown algae and some green algae on the rock. I've slowly started introducing a cleanup crew in the form of like hermit crabs, snails, etc. And they're slowly beating the algae back. I'm not a fan of like dumping a tremendous amount of cleanup crew and just wipe everything out in one night and they end up starving. So I kind of take the slower approach. Uh, let's go Let's go for the equipment first and then we're gonna go into livestock. Equipment wise is being lit by three of the uh, Radeon Gen 5 XL15s. Uh, these are the pro, uh, not the blue ones. Been a big fan of them so far. In terms of water circulation, I'm using the uh, Ecotec MP40. Uh, I got two of them running on anti-sync trying to create that wave motion with not much success at the moment, but I'm still tuning it. So eventually, hopefully we'll get there. On the return oscillos, I do have the random flow generator on both ends over here. Coming down into the sump, this may be a little bit difficult to see because I got the blue light on. I am running the Vertex Omega 180i for uh, a skimmer, great, great skimmer. Um, and over there you see I got some dosing tubes and these actually hooked up to, let me slide this chair out. I'm running the Algotronic with the Dosatronic actually parked right behind it. I am currently dosing ATI uh, Coral Essential Pro, but I'm just doing a really small amount because there's not much consumption uh, in the tank at the moment. And down here we got a red's nest of wires that we're not going to talk about. <laughs> Alright, so... Overall, the tank is a mold aquarium, 135 gallon uh, infinity series. And the interesting thing about this tank is the dimension. It is a four foot tank by 30 inches by 20 inches in height. And I really, really like this dimension. I wasn't sure if I would be a fan of the uh, shorter height compared to the other tank I had, which is a one, one, uh, 150. And that was, that was tall, it's like 36 inches in height. And there's only 20. However, in terms of actual maintenance, um, I'm a big fan. It's much easier uh, with my short stubby arms, I'm able to reach the bottom of the tank versus the, one for, uh, the 150, which has kind of a sketchy seam. That's why I kind of uh, gave, gave up on it. Um, I was not able to reach the bottom of the tank, although it does look a lot more impressive when I stand in front of the tank itself. But in terms of maintenance, it's much easier, and I think the 30 inches in depth more than made up for it. And in terms of livestock, let's go a little bit into it. Uh, recently, I started experimenting more with Gorgonians because I feel like it's pretty underrepresented in this hobby and they really give some nice motion to a tank and they're much easier than SPS. Keith, I know you're a big fan of SPS. I am totally a newbie when it comes to SPS and I hope to really jump into your world uh, a little later on, maybe in a year's mark. With that said though, last week, um, one of the great local reefer, Lynn, actually hooked me up with some SPS. So I'm kind of like thrust into this world a little bit earlier. So those would be my test pieces. So far, they seems okay. I think that's a mini right there. It's kind of hairy. Uh, it's retracted because I just turned on the light. But the Monty Digitata looks good. And those two acros has not bleached out yet. So I'm kind of crossing my fingers. But in terms of livestock, 
Uh, for the first year, I plan to focus more on the soft corals, something a little bit easier. For example, like the Gorgonia I mentioned, uh, the Zoa Garden I moved over from my old tank, which was a 45-gallon mixed reef, uh, Xenias, and start venturing a little bit more into LPS. One other interesting thing that I'm trying out right now is MPS. I've kind of dabbled in it just a tiny bit in the past, but uh, the feeding regimen is a little bit... Uh, too much for me at the time, but nowadays since we're all working from home uh, <laughs> with who knows how long I'm getting a little bit back into the MPS world. We got a fetendro, we got sun uh, sun corals, and then we got black and brown sun coral in the back as well. Over here, it's one of my favorite coral that is a space invader. And right here, I need to give a shout out, I hope that's okay, to uh, my Reef Sensei Business Telegram. He has been helping me tremendously. Um, and this space invader is actually pretty. Uh, pretty sensitive towards elk swing and that's something that I've had a lot of in my old tank so every time I have trouble with space invader I send it over to uh, Mr. Reef Sensei Jim and he'll always heal it up and the frag it will always come back double the size uh, but so far it's doing well and in case anybody's wondering what that thing is it's actually a uh, mushroom cage and this came from I think like uh, gallery aquatica from Australia thanks to 2k reefers for sending it to me like three years ago now at this point and inside there is a Japanese pink uh, nephews uh, that I've been hunting on for a while and Lin was also able to secure one for me so again thank you um, besides that tank is uh, pretty much in the beginning phase so it's not much going on in here and it's crazy because all those corals came from my 45 gallon tank which looks really full of them on but once I dump it into this 135 it looks like it's really empty, so I gotta fill this up. All right, so this is a really quick snapshot of this 135 gallon tank. If you have any questions, let's talk about it. Wow, that's pretty cool, man. We we're, were talking a little bit during that video and um, a, couple, a couple of comments on my end in terms of what I saw there. First, I'll, I was, I'm really digging that scape. Really cool, I love the, uh, the arch, kind of like in the middle. How did, how did you do that? Was that a lot of uh, putty and... I yeah, yeah, I used the, uh, it's called Macro 400, the cement. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I use that, but it's kind of like a tedious process because it dries so fast. So I'll do some, let it dry, and then like do some more, and but each time I have to mix it. Yeah, so that this is this was a complete dry rock uh, only tank that you started. Or did you take some of the rock from your old uh, 45? I did that a little bit later. So I added dry rock first, maybe like two or three weeks later, I started adding uh, live rocks slowly. I'm trying not to like, I try to postpone it as much as possible because I'm afraid that if the tank water is too new, the live rock goes in, just may kill everything on there. What, um, so what you said, you've kind of, you're kind of going through a little ugly phase right now. What, um, what's it been like in terms of starting the tank and, and has it been kind of like up to expectations? Because, you know, that's normal in terms of the ugly uh, phase. I mean, that's just something you got to like live, live with. But um... I think it's like, Probably better than expected. I was expecting like full tank of like hair algae and somehow I avoided it probably thanks to the bowel media. Uh, but I do get like brown diatoms and like green algae, but those are all manageable. The only thing is the cloudy water that I get every like two, three weeks. Oh, really? Sure. Yeah. So maybe due to the amount I'm feeding as well because of those MPS corals. But um, hopefully the bacteria colony is going to get stronger and stronger in the tank and be able to like absorb all of those. Have you just kind of like been leaving that alone or have you been using UV to try to clear up the cloudy water? People have suggested UV. I have not really dabbled in it yet. Like I'm trying not to add another piece of equipment to the tank if possible. So I'm trying to just let it do its thing. I, I mean, I do water change, but the cloudiness didn't really go away as much as I thought it would. So I'm just riding it out. Like the first time I did water change, no, the first two times I did water change and added carbon. Uh, this last time I just kind of let it ride and it just burned itself out after like three or four days. So it's it's okay. Yeah, you're right. I mean, if um, it it will eventually go away on its own because things will work themselves out. I mean, I I you know, for my current tank when I started it up, I got a uh, I had a bacterial bloom and cloudy water, and, and I use this really cheap um, portable like UV. So it wasn't something I had to plumb in to the uh, system, and then basically it just inserted into the sump, and like within one or two days, the whole water was like crystal clear, and then I took it out. Oh wow! So you know, it's that's a quick fix, but. Um, I, I don't think it's something you really have to, um, you know, aggressively uh, treat, in my opinion. How many, do you remember how many watts that? I believe it was like 45 watts. I could send you a link after the show. 
that'll be cool. The, the, uh, I think it's called the uh, the AA Green uh, Machine or something to that effect. It's um, very economical. Sure. Hey, that sounds like the one from uh, Finding Nemo. Yes. <laughs> the in dentist's office. Yeah, yeah. Sounds something like, something like Green Machine. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll love to check it out. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll uh, make a note to send that to you. So, dimension wise, um, I love wide tanks, thirty inches wide. You um, you mentioned that it's. 20 inches uh, high, which is going to be the same height as my new um, Lagoon Peninsula style reef tank that's coming in. And, um, yeah. you know, so it was, it was interesting that you said that um, it's, it seems to be taller than it actually is, which makes, uh, makes me feel good about um, going 20 inches high. But yeah, I, I kind of like that, uh, that Lagoon type of uh, look, but how, how do you feel about the height so far in terms of that and, and the width and the, and the size of the tank? First of all, Keith, I did not know we we're back live. <laughs> I thought we were oh. chatting. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, look at where you know. I was like, oh, we've been chatting. Okay, all right, all right. I'm that's what this is all at. about. You and I are just okay, talking. All right, that's we're, cool. We're just, that's we're cool. just rapping. Now we're talking. You know, everybody's listening to us, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so yes, before before the one thirty five, the one fifty, I had a super tall tank. It's like thirty six inches. I, I I love the fact that when I stand in front of a tank, I don't see the top edge and the bottom edge. I feel like I'm immersed, right? So I thought I was gonna I was gonna hate the uh, twenty inches high, but probably because of how high the stand is, I forgot the exact measurement. But it kind of brings it up to the eye level. So uh, I I can live with it. I, I like it. I like it, and I feel like the width which is like 30 inches width, more than made up for the lack of height. Like it really gives you that like nice depth of field or the depth that you can play with. It, um, it, it, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's just in terms of being able to have the options for aquascaping, the, uh, the width of the tank. I mean, my new tank that's coming is 36 inches wide. and I've never had one that wide. I've always had my last two tanks have been 30 inches wide. And I think you're going to, um, you know, I'm sure you, uh, you're already digging it. But it yeah. just uh, really opens things up a lot, and uh, it's great. You know, you know what I wish uh, Motochromes would have done. Um, just kind of like right now, the back is a uh, black. It's kind of like glass and acrylic behind the glass. So it's all blacked out. I wish it's clear so I can do a backlit tank as well. Because like with backlit tank, it gives it so much more depth. And imagine like 30 inches or in your case, 36 inches. And it's clear in the back. Put a backlight on it. Put a little frosted like window film. It's going to look amazing. Yeah, no, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, my tank is, uh, is the new tank's going to be a peninsula. So I've never had a peninsula tank. And I'm definitely looking forward to that. But, you know, I always think of a reef tank as, uh, as uh, multidimensional and, and uh, I think it's evolved over the years. A lot of um, folks used to, and still do, you know, have a tank built into the wall. And that's when I, when I went um, to a local fish store in Connecticut, the guy that had this kick-ass SPS Dominant Reef tank, it was basically built into the wall. I was like, wow, I'm going to copy that. So, uh, I, you know, I started a 120-gallon tank that was built into the wall. But then, you know, as, as time, um, you know, went on and I saw more and more tanks, it was like, wow, you know, these tanks should really be more multidimensional. And, and uh, you yeah. should be like thinking about viewing on the sides and even on the top. And that's when people started with the rimless tanks. And, and you know, that, that whole um, kind of perspective, I think, is really cool. So it's like, you know, almost like four-dimensional in terms of the front, the two sides, and the top of the tank. And I think that's very important to consider when you're trying to figure out the dimensions of a tank to, uh, to start up. Absolutely. And um, Peninsula Tank could be challenging to aquascape as well. Because uh, if you need to view it kind of like lengthwise from the front and the back, you are almost cutting the depth in half, right? The way you escape it, it'll be kind of tricky to kind of like make the, that depth work for you. So I'm really looking forward to see how you how you face this challenge. But yeah, me if, too. If anybody can pull it off, that's you. <laughs> so looking forward. To it. You know, I was watching the uh, the BRS video. Have you seen this one with uh, Ryan's uh, tank? And and I think it's a 360 gallon tank. And there was one video where um, he was um, talking about the aquascaping and and. He got some um, stuff that was made by um, Top Shelf Aquatics, and oh yeah, dude, have you it seen was, that? Um, is it Tahiti Rocks? Like Haitian, the, it was Haitian, 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 Haitian Rocks. Right? Rock. Yeah, have you seen that? Oh man, yeah. People can't find Haitian Rocks anywhere, and of course, I've got Haitian that. Like, I've got that in my tank. I've got Haitian no. Live Rock in my 187 gallon tank. Five years ago, when I was down in Florida, um, I think it was called Sea and Reef, I believe, it was the um, mm. the LFS down in, in Orlando, and. I, I did a video on it. I kind of like scored the mother load of live rock with this Haitian live rock. I mean, they, um, they were awesome and they got a shipment in and I was down there on vacation and, and I just was able to cherry pick a whole bunch of cool pieces. So yeah, I've got that 
in my 187 gallon tank and i even have about 20 pounds of, that's left over in a rubbermaid right now that um i'm hoping to use oh, in, my, in the uh, in the new tank but uh don't 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 say it out loud people are gonna kick down your door yeah no, i know right all right but enough about me this is about we're, we're, we're here talking about your reef and, and, and your stuff. Well, we're just chatting. We can talk about Yeah, we can, okay. you know, I guess we yeah. can talk about anything. I'm just looking, scrolling through here to make sure there's uh, no questions that we're missing. Uh, let's see here. Um, well, here's a, here's a random question. Braveheart Reef for 525. Hey, Moki, will you, will you ever get another frogfish? Oh, great question. Uh, I'll tell you. I told you, well, I told people that I would not, but every time I go to a fish store, I see a frogfish. I'm just like, oh, I I wish. I feel like if I end up keeping two, maybe two or three tanks, then one of them will be dedicated to another frogfish. Although this time around, I may may try my hand at a giant frogfish, the Commerson one. Like, they're kind of ugly, but they're like big. And I don't know, I just something about it. They, they look kind of comical. And with the giant frogfish, I feel like it may be easier to feed because I can just go down to like an Asian supermarket and buy one of those like frozen fish and there you go. <laughs> so I, I would love to. But at the moment, because I'm kind of consolidating all the reef tanks, probably not. And the reason I said that if I do two or three more is because if I were to do another reef tank, I really want to try a uh, garden yield tank, like oh, one of these yeah. like really deep tank, yeah. or like a drop-off tank and just spin it around so the uh, the deep end is all filled with sand and have the garden yield there. Uh, so that's kind of one of my um, bucket list. But after that, yeah, frogfish, I love one. I my, my fa- One of my favorite fish is the uh, a flame hawkfish. And um, mm. I love them because they're goofy. And they have yep. they have problems swimming, you know. They're just constantly perching themselves on on a a coral or a rock or the bottom, and and um, so yeah, I think they have a lot of personality. And, you know, fish in a reef tank is is uh, it's a very personal thing, but um, yep. it's also a very important thing I think too. And and um, yeah, you know, it's it's um, some folks like to have a lot of fish in a tank. Others just kind of like have have you know more featuring the corals versus the fish. But that's a great thing about the hobby. It's just um, you know, you kind of like do your own thing. Totally. I think I'm more fish person than a coral person. I know a lot of people are more like a coral coral person before a fish person, but I'm kind of like fish. They're like little puppy dogs. I'm digging your uh, Da Vinci clownfish. You know what? They are actually from CN Reef originally. Oh, really? I bought them from uh, Blue Ribbon Aquatics, which is a local fish store, and they actually order the clowns from CN Reef. Yeah, okay, right. They're, they're actually kind of close to me. I think they're in... Um... Or, or I'm, I'm thinking about cultivated reef. You're, you're talking about sea and reef. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, we have another random question here from uh, GD. My tank had been up a couple of months, and I guess this is relevant because you're, you're, we're looking at your uh, relatively new tank. And uh, I've read we should wait a year before really starting to add corals. Is that your uh, recommendation, too, for a newbie? Do you want to take it, or you want me to? Uh, you go first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my channel name is called Inappropriate Reefer. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I wouldn't... As long as the water parameter is good, I feel like it's okay. I feel like the cycling process is more for the fish, more so than the hardier corals. Uh, case in point, in my case, I added corals to the tank behind me. I think probably about two months mark. I added some easier ones first, like green star polyp, mushroom, and stuff like that to test the water, make sure it's okay. They look okay. They're even happier in this tank than my old tank. So I started moving more corals in. But again, I'm keeping an eye out, make sure like ammonia, nit- nitrite, nitrate, nothing is like really spiking. Uh, I would absolutely not add any hard- harder stuff like SPS in there anytime that soon. Uh, in turn on enemy, actually, I got a lot of questions about like when's a good time to add an enemies. Usually, I think the general consensus is like about half a year for bubble tip. The uh, other type maybe a little bit later. So um, uh, what do you think, Keith? Yeah, I mean, I, I always think that nothing good happens in a reef tank um, quickly and that patience is a, you know, a virtue. So I think the longer that you can um, you know, wait out in terms of um, you know, adding livestock, the better. But you, know, you also do need to kind of get that cycle going and, and really um, um, you know, get the bacteria bit built up. So you know, I always recommend um, you know, obviously adding fish uh, first or a cleanup crew that, you know, hardy fish that can kind of take the, um, the elevated, um, you know, nitrites and ammonia, if there are any present in a, in a tank. And, and, you know, and then if those do well, then you kind of step it up a little bit to something that's um, not as hardy. 
And, you know, in terms of corals, I would add stuff that really uh, can, can take it. You know, so, um, you know, Zoas probably, right, and, and some, some um, you know, really easy to keep LPS for, for Acropora. You know, you can certainly add them, um, you know, way before a year. But again, stuff, you know, really easy stuff like Montipora, branching Montipora, cupping Montipora. And, and you just got to kind of see how things do and, and do a lot of testing at the beginning, too, to make sure that, um, you know, the tank is fully cycled and, and kind of ready to rock and roll in terms of corals. And, and um, you know, make sure that, um, you know, you've got stable parameters before you start adding in um, livestock. I think that's something you got to really pay attention to. So, uh, all right, we got some more comments going on here. Uh, Jason's commenting, I think, about my swallowtail angelfish in the background. <laughs> my, my, he's jealous of the swallowtail angelfish. Those are reef safe, by the way. Um, they, they're, they're great fish. So if you're looking for an angelfish for a reef tank, swallowtail is definitely a good one to, uh, to add in. Um, Brandon Chow, I have a pair of clowns and a BTA. Is there any tips on how to get them to pair? Oh, boy. Hey, my fellow chows, <laughs> let me tell you, um, I waited one year for my clownfish to go into my bubble tube anemone, so I may not be the best person, but I can tell you what I've read and what I've tried. Um, I've heard that if you show them a picture of a clownfish in, a, uh, in an anemone, that will help. I tried it, did not help, but it helped some people. <laughs> I've, uh, I've heard that if you play movie videos, uh, play video clips of clownfish being hosted by an anemone, that will help. I tried it, did not help, but it helped work with some people as well. I tried to put a bubble tube anemone inside a specimen container with a clownfish. They kind of touch each other a little bit unwillingly, but as soon as they go back in the tank, they just go to separate ways. So it did not really help in my case as well. But ultimately, uh, about a year later, they just naturally found each other. Um, that's all I got. Keith, how about you? You know, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting you know, question. I, I, I have uh, clownfish that when I added them to the tank, I, well, I, I had a pair of clownfish, one perished, right? So I had, um, I added a, a new one to the pre-existing one and they, um, they did not hang out together. They were not paired up. Um, I was really bummed out. They were both kind of like hanging out in different corners of the tank. So one was like hanging out in the left hand, upper left hand corner. And the other one was hanging out in the upper right hand corner of the tank. Oh man. And it was going, I was going on for months. And they would not really, they would only kind of come to the front of the tank when, you know, when, when uh, I fed the tank. But um, finally, one, one of the clowns found one of the um, um, alveopora in the right front of my tank. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Because, you know, every time I've had clownfish in my reef tanks, they've always hosted some sort of uh, LPS coral. I've never had good luck with an enemy, so I've never put an enemy in the tank that... Uh, live that long. I, I tried a bubble tip and it just got sucked up into my, uh, one of my, uh, pumps, recirculating mm. pumps. And so that was like, ah, the hell with that. But, um, so yeah, I, they've always like hosted something like a leather coral or a torch coral or, or the gonoporia alveopora. But, you know, finally one of these hosted a, uh, a coral. And I was like, all right, but maybe the other one will, uh, do that as well. Well, you know, this went on for like a, a year. And then I looked in the, um, in the back corner of my tank and I saw some eggs. I was like, oh, wow, what? I, what? these things are actually spawning and they never hang out together. I never saw them together. And um, so they, they've actually spawned several times. And now they're um, one's hosting one coral and the other's hosting another coral. Sometimes I see them in the same coral. So it's, a, it's kind of a weird thing going on in my tank, Mogi. I don't know what's, uh, what to make of it. But um, the cool thing is they, they're out of the, uh, the upper corner you know, upper corners of the tank. So I feel it's crazy. Yeah. Do they, do they like, so they don't hang out at all. Do they kind of like, uh, like chill near the eggs, take care of the eggs together? Yes. Or no, they just, yes. kinda... when the eggs are there, okay. then they're, it's, it's fascinating to watch that behavior. How often okay. do you, do, uh, do, do, does your pair spawn? Do they spawn? <sighs> None yet. Oh, wow. None yet. I, I've never had uh, clownfish spawn in my care. Like even really? in the old days, I've had clownfish for years and just, they just never spawn. I don't know why. Wow, that's uh, that is odd. Yeah, I've, I've had some pretty good luck with that. I've um, I've been, I guess, fortunate. Um, yeah, maybe I'm just looking like this, and they feel kind of <laughs> they have no privacy. You know? <laughs> yeah, give them their space, Moki. Yeah, back gotta, off a little I bit. I got some like one way window screen on it, and um, oh man. Let's see. So, carry real talk TV. Are you kidding me? That's one heck of a uh, a name there. That's the name. <laughs> um, hey, Moki, when are you adding some Acropora? I think you talked about that um, maybe a year out. Yeah. 
yeah, Lynn surprised me with some like a uh, fantastic local reefer. She's like super generous. Um, and we're we're doing like a uh, she's hooking me up with some stuff. I'm bringing some stuff back, and all of a sudden she gave me this big box. I'm like, okay, that's kind of strange, but all right. So I took it home, opened it up. I'm like, what are all these? And among them, uh, there are some Echoporos. I was like, oh, I'm not sure, but they seem to be doing okay back here. Uh, if not, I know who to turn to. So there you go. I think I should, uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. man. Whenever you're ready. Yeah, local local reefers, local reefers, and also like experts like you guys online, like fantastic, fantastic, yeah. really great resources. And I honestly, I wish I have access to folks like you guys back in the days when I first started. Then it would have like saved me from a lot of heartaches and saved me from killing a lot of animals. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes you got to learn by doing. Yeah. Um, all right, so Loki, we we got another video to show here of your 17 gallon macro mangrove uh, grove tank. So let me um, let's play that. Check that okay. out, and then um, I'm going to mute our sound, and we'll uh, come back and talk about that one. So let's, Sounds let's good. roll it. Okay, here's my second tank. This is what I call the 17-gallon mangrove macro algae tank. And the theme of this tank is obviously, number one, the uh, mangrove tree I got over here, and number two, all the macro algae I'm trying to grow in here. I'm resisting the urge to add more corals in here, but it's tough, man. As reefers, when we see corals, we just want to like stuff them in. So a couple of noteworthy things about this tank. Number one is the uh, Christmas tree worm rock. I've had this for a couple years already at this point. And of course, we also have some Gorgonians right here. Also got some fragments uh, of Gorgonian in the back. Uh, this is actually pretty interesting. They, they're known as a blue zinnias. Um, the scientific name C something, I'm not gonna try to pronounce this, I'm terrible at it. But under pure white light, it actually has a nice blue and purple sheen. It's almost like satin like in uh, texture material, which is really cool. And in terms of macroalgae, I got these uh, palm tree macroalgae. It's kind of similar to the feather macroalgae, but the feather one is really invasive, grows really fast. This palm tree type is a lot more under control. And I also got a couple types of uh, red macros in here. And because this tank is gonna be a macroalgae tank, I'm kind of careful in terms of fish I add in here. And um, no animal crab or a certain herbivore that's gonna destroy all the macroalgae population. So in terms of fish selections, uh, I have a dwarf rainbow fish, and this is the blue back, blue eye dwarf rainbow fish. Man, it's mouthful. And these guys are kind of actu actually brackish. They're found in Australia, and some people actually keep them in full strength saltwater tank, just like me here. And they've been doing really well. They're really interesting fish that have really interesting uh, social hierarchies and social interaction. The male is going to spar each other um, at a certain time of the day. It's actually about that time. So let me. S we'll see if they actually do it on camera. But as you can see. The fish may not be as colorful as saltwater fish that we're used to, but they're small and they show together. So that's something rare for a nano tank. Uh, that's why I want to kind of point them out specifically. Now in terms of corals, I do have mostly softies and LPS here. Uh, the frog spawn is not happy at all because I recently light shocked them. I was trying to find a more white uh, spectrum for this tank to better show off the rat macro algae. And as a result, I did not know I was blasting a tank with like 200 plus par. Uh, the light did not look that bright to my eyes, and I think that's kind of like an issue I've had in my reefing career until um, I got access to a PAR meter, which I stupidly did not use when tuning the light. I was like, oh, it looks kind of white, it looks kind of dim, should be okay. Nope, 200 plus PAR. So that's why the frog spawn is kind of angry right now, and I'm lowering the light to let them uh, recover. Ideally, I want about like 70 PARs and stuff like that uh, in this tank, so I'm kind of still tweaking it. So since we talk about light, let's talk about equipment really quickly. I'm running the uh, Radeon G4 Pro here. This used to be light over my uh, old 45 gallon tank, so I'm repurposing it here, hanging from the ceiling. For the mangrove, we have the Zitlite UFO, also a really nice reef light. I just happen to have it, and I tune it more white to better uh, grow the mangrove with. For water circulation, I'm using a MP10 Quiet Drive. It's on the Mobius platform, so it's really easy to tune and using short pulls. Just like downstairs, I'm trying to get a wave going, and of course, no luck yet, so I'm still slowly tuning it. For the other part of water circulation, I'm actually using a XP Aqua. Uh, this is the in-tank sump. I think that maybe was called a sumpless ATO. Not sure the proper name, but basically it has a little uh, power head inside the uh, the little box right there. So pool water from the water surface. Before I, before I install this unit, I always have some oil sleek at the top of the water surface because uh, there's not too much water circulation up here. Uh, it's uh, water um, agitation. But after installing it, the oil film's totally gone. 
the problem was that the the output is really strong, it's really directional. So I ended up finding a, one of these nozzles from one of the old real pump I got and I just kind of super glue it on. I painted black first, of course. And I super glue it on and to redirect the flow a little bit more uh, towards the surface, a little bit more spread out and gentle. So that seems to be working out well. And that's pretty much it. I have it hooked up to a doser. I'm hoping, um, I'm dosing maybe like two or three milliliter of all for reef uh, once a day, but pretty much that's pretty much it in terms of equipment for this tank. So uh, I started out trying to do a pretty simple setup, not too much going on, no sump, no like hardcore filtration and stuff like that, and uh, just rely on water change. So that's a goal for this tank. It's fun little projects and is right next to my uh, home office. So once in a while, I'll just kind of like squat right there and just look at the tank and feed the fish. I actually feed the fish pretty often, maybe uh, four times a day because these guys are small and really active. So I feel like they may benefit with uh, more frequent feeding. Uh, again, this is just like a snapshot of this tank right here. Uh, let's talk about it. Ah, oh, Moki, man, that's, that's a cool tank. I'm, I'm digging a lot of things about that tank. Talk, talk to talk to us more about the fish. I mean, I was we're talking during the video that um, they, they look like uh, tetras, and it's it's a nice look for a nano tank like that. Thanks. Are we are we back? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're back, back man. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at YouTube. I was like, oh, okay, there's a delay. I'm quick. You uh, know? Yes. Yeah, I don't look at YouTube. So, uh, yeah, so those are the um, uh, blue back, blue eye. Dwarf rainbow fish. I gotta think every time I pronounce its name because it's uh, so 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 long and truncated. Uh, so I came across them from a reefs.com article, like I think two years ago, when I was uh, trying to decide what fish to keep in this nano tank, because the 17 gallon is not huge. I can't. They're pretty limited in terms of fish choice. I want to do something a little bit interesting, especially if you can do some kind of fish that can like, that can show in this small amount of space. Uh, so that reefs.com article came up. And I learned about this kind of fish, and they are actually brackish fish. But they can take a salinity all the way from like freshwater to like a 40 PPT uh, in terms of salinity. And they can live indefinitely in that uh, situation. So I was able to locate a breeder for these fish and was lucky enough to get 12 of them. But unfortunately, they did not all make it. I think like within the first two or three weeks, I lost three. And then since then, I've lost two at this point. But the rest seems healthy. So I'm kind of like crossing my fingers. I don't think there's any... Well, I kind of take that back. I, I was going to say, I don't think there's any predator in the tank. But today I did find one fish kind of lost its tail. It's still swimming, but it lost its tail. Almost like got like chopped clean off, which is really weird. I got some pretty big Bristol worms in there. So I wonder if that could play a factor. I'm not sure, but I don't want to jump to conclusion at the same time. So I'm kind of kind of watching it and we'll see. But an interesting fish for sure. You never know what uh, lives in a reef tank. You never really do know unless you're watching it at night. <laughs> that's true that's, that's so true so bahama llama coral kind of beat me to this question in terms of uh the mangrove and and uh it looks awesome how hard is it to keep a mangrove how has it been uh easy moderately difficult in your opinion okay um it's a kind of like a tricky question simply because like the one i have success with this one i got it maybe half a year ago from another reefer who has success with this one the way he kept it was just in the back of tank and it was just using whatever light got spilled over from the main tank. And uh, before I got this one, I know this this tree is about three years old and it was already kind of grown out. So I don't want to kill it. So I did a lot of research. I came across Mr. Julian Sprung's uh, paper on keeping red mangrove. And there's some fantastic tips in there, including like don't damage the roots because like if you damage the roots, you kind of have to like take it back to fresh water and slowly mm. after the roots heal, acclimate back into salt water. I think that's one of the big things that a lot of people uh, may be missing. Um, and the other thing that I did different for this mangrove is that I have a specific light just for it versus just using whatever is spilled over to, from the tank. This way I can kind of cater the light, lighting needs for the mangrove tree versus just whatever the reef tank got. And um, I feel like this really helped this particular plant because initially, Maybe I had to light up a little bit too um, too strong. Some of the leaves started curling back. If I were just using the whatever light was from the reef tank, I may not be able to dial it back or I may not be able to adjust it. But because as a separate unit, I feel like it really helped in my case. 
the problem the problem I had in the past is that I always get like a mango pot and just kind of like chuck it in the sump or like stick it in the back, hang on the back filter, and nothing ever happened. If it ever, if you even have two leaves, sometimes they'll drop and they just never quite made it. I feel like I did not give them enough respect that they deserve, so they did not really sprout and grow for me. Versus this time around, I was like, okay, I'm gonna treat this as like a living organism. It, it has its own specific needs, and let's cater to it. And as a result, I was able to kind of like keep it growing. Because I was really afraid that during that move, the root may have been damaged or whatnot, but I just carried on. So it's um it's fantastic. Uh, it, but I think like for people who are interested in growing red mangrove, definitely try to look at um, Mr. Julian Sprung's PDF on red mangrove. If you just do a search online, you should be able to find it. That was really helpful. Yeah, they're really neat. I would like to definitely try one of those uh, one of these days. So, um, well, can you talk about? You know this nano reef tank experience versus uh, having a larger reef tank. Has it been um, easier to keep, more difficult? What, what's your opinion on that? I think in terms of like difficulty, it's about the same. There's different sets of challenges. Um, for me, I came from kind of like a. I'm more comfortable with like smaller tanks simply because I've kept like 45, 30s, 10 gallon, 20 gallons. A uh, big tank is actually new for me. Uh, smaller tank has smaller challenges because, as you know, the water temperature swings so fast. The water evaporates, salinity swings, and once the salinity goes, everything follows. Or if you overdose something, or if you overfeed something, things just get out of whack quick. So that's challenge number one. The second challenge I find myself facing is finding the proper equipment. Because a lot of uh, equipment is a little bit bigger, which is fine for a bigger reef tank. But when you go for nano tank, you want everything to be like kind of like to scale or maybe even disappear. So it's really hard to find these kind of like slim profile equipment. So that's another challenge as well. Um, but in terms of difficulty level, I think it's roughly it's roughly the same in, in my experience. Yeah, interesting. I've never, um, I'm trying to think that the smallest reef tank that I ever had was a, um, I think a 90 gallon. So, you know, I started out similar to you. I think um, I started out with like a two gallon freshwater beta tank. Then I graduated mm -hmm. to a 29 gallon uh, planted, uh, you know, freshwater aquarium with some tetras. But then I just kind of like jumped right into a, a, a large reef tank. So I've never had a nano reef tank. And I would like to try that as well, too. I mean, they look really cool. And maybe just have like a, a nano with like an anemone and, you know, that hopefully I won't, won't kill. And uh, a couple of clownfish would be pretty neat. But uh, yeah, you know, one of these days. Well well, you know, the easy thing about small tank, though, is like the water changes are so effective. You know, uh, talk about a fix-all. In a small tank, it's so easy to swap out like 30, even 40% of the water and you're all set. And in fact, one of the uh, small challenge I did in the past was actually a wheat reef uh, jar. It's like a small, I think it's like maybe like one gallon or maybe like 1.2 gallon. It's a little vast like that. And the approach that people take when it comes to small pico tanks like this is that you don't let the tank cycle. Hmm. Basically, every week, you just swap out oh, all the water. And that's yeah, it's interesting. Although, now, that is not to say that's how everybody approaches it. Certain ones actually have like a sand bed and try to keep like a healthy a colony of bacteria that can handle all the load throughout the week. But uh, a lot of ones I've seen that I was going to do as well, it just swap out the water. And it's easy when you have out a reef tank. You just take water from reef tank, right? And that's it. Yeah, I've, I've thought about doing that. That's a, that's a great idea. So, um, well, can yeah. we talk about, uh, and this is a question that uh, GD, uh, GD had uh, a while ago, but uh, talk about your, uh, your maintenance um, schedules and practices with, with uh, both tanks. I mean, are they similar with both tanks, or do you, do you kind of like um, have similar things that you do in terms of water changes with both, or something different with the larger versus the smaller one? What, um, what's your routine like? That's a great question. Uh, this also comes into like small tank, big tank. When I have smaller tanks like the 45 and the smaller ones uh, like the mangrove 17, I try to do water change every two weeks or every three weeks. Uh, obviously, if something is wrong, I'll do a little bit more frequently uh, given that the fresh really makes salt water similar in parameters as the current tank. With the big tank, when I, set, when I set out to do it, I thought about doing something like no water change because, you know, if I can do no water change, yeah. and. The, the volume of water I have to change just boggles my mind coming from like a 45 gallon tank. But after I started doing it, um, I started doing it a little bit smarter thanks to uh, some people's recommendation using pump to pump up water versus like dumping buckets. Yeah. You know, it's actually a lot 
more painless than I thought it would be. So what ended up happening is that I've been doing water change maybe once a month. I've done it like three times at this point, and it's it's not bad. I just have to like kind of hang out in the basement while the water is being pumped out and pumped back in. What, uh, it's, it's not what percent do you normally do? Like what percentage of the water do you change out? So for the big tank, I change out about I'll say 30, 30 gallon ish. Okay. So 30 gallon to 135. My math is terrible. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> for the small tank, I change out about 35 to sometimes even 40 gallons of the water. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm more aggressive with the small tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, in, in terms of parameters, what do you like to keep your parameters at in terms of, um, you know, alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate? What are your, uh, what are your kind of target levels for that stuff? So for my alkalinity, I try to aim for like 8.5. Now, does that always happen? <laughs> now it's a little bit easier with the Alcatronic, but before, at least that's kind of like target and shooting 8.5 or 9. Uh, calcium, usually like four, like the standard 420. Uh, magnesium, for whatever reason, I always have really high magnesium, like sometimes even like beyond the 1500s. Mm. Nitrate phosphate, I try to keep them detectable. They fluctuate a bit, um, especially back in the 45 gallon days. My refugium was really beefy, so they always just drain all the phosphate out, and I try to dose it in. But just as long as they're detectable, I'm not too kind of like stuck on uh, specific numbers. Yeah, you know, I always, um, you know, say that it's it's not a good idea to chase numbers with a reef tank, and and that you shouldn't just, um, you know, be making constant change because your corals are not going to like that. And um, right. you know, sometimes it's just. It, it makes much more sense to stay pat, um, leave things alone. But you know, you gotta you gotta observe the tank on a daily basis, and you gotta kind of um, you know go with some gut instinct sometimes. But yeah, usually I've found that um, the more you change, the the less um, you know healthy the tank is going to be. So patience is certainly good in that regard too. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think like in some way, having multiple tanks really help with this because I find myself like. I want to mess with it, like, say I adjusted something in the big tank. I really want to mess with it like, because I'm not seeing results. I can kind of force myself to, okay, let's not touch a tank. Let's focus on small tank first, right? If I'm, <laughs> let's tweak something, like frack up some corals, screw some corals, so I can leave the tank alone. So in that aspect, like, I feel like having multiple tanks actually help. So do you, um, do you use any coral supplements or, or, or coral food for your tanks? Or do you uh, just feed your fish and let the, um, that, that food feed the corals um i do i do i actually do um the hold on i'm trying to get an email oh, coral amino oh yeah um, bright so i use that uh it's kind of hard to see like whether they actually work or not but i feel like coral seems to respond positively to it so i keep dosing it um beyond that i do feed reef nutritions uh all the liquid foods that I really like, yep. like the oyster feed, uh, phyto, phytoplatins, uh, ROE and stuff like that, and also the TDO, the fish foods. And of course, I also do like coral food, like reef roids, um, uh, the BLS one. So it's like, it's like a mix of different things. Right. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I play around with that stuff as well, too. You know, it's, um, it's kind of hard to, to say exactly, you know, which ones are, are um, effective and which ones are not. But uh, I think the bottom line is you don't want to like have the, um, you know, like, like you say, you don't want to bottom out nutrients and, um, you know, you want to have, you, you don't want to starve your corals. So it's, it's good to be able to, uh, at least either feed your tank heavily or use some sort of supplements. And, and I always believe in a good, um, you know, high import, high export. So if you're feeding a lot, then just make sure you're exporting a lot and just have that, um, that fine, uh, balance with the, um, with the corals. Yeah, I'm still trying to find a balance with the big tank since it's so new. Um, the refugium has not really kicked in yet, uh, so I'm still slowly getting there. So in, in terms of SPS, you're, you're talking about a year uh, potentially out, it, and I'm, I'm assuming that um, you know, for, the, uh, for, the, for the larger tank, that's, uh, that's the goal. You've got, you've, you, know, you did show a few frags in there. How, how are those frags doing at this point? Hold on. Give me one second. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you. Um, the millies look good. The acro, I mean, the color's not there. It's not bleached out, but I don't see really good pile of extension. But they're not dead. The Monty, Monty's happy. Monty's all out. Yeah, they seem, they seem okay. Like, I was hoping that maybe, like, 
at the one year mark, I can really like switch gear in the tank and start going full SPS. But these are fantastic test pieces as well. I feel a little bit more confident, I think, that I don't kill them right off the bat. But that was go. Uh, initially, maybe softies, uh, Gorgonians, maybe some LPS, and then year in, we'll keep some like easier Montes. And then year and a half, we can start really deep going to acro. But having these frags, if they actually do well, maybe they'll kind of like change your mind a little bit to go a little bit earlier. How are the uh, Gorgonians doing? They seem happy. They seem happy. I crank up the flow because I realize they're not moving as much as they should be, especially with all the uh, video I see in Under the Sea. They're all like yep. insane. Uh, so I crank up the flow. They seem a lot happier. And I mounted a couple of them a little bit higher up because I feel like they're a little bit more acclimated to the light now. So they should be okay. But yeah, good polyp extension. They're happy. So um, you mentioned you, you know, you're using the Alcatronic and, and what have you. And, and you talked about some of the other equipment that you use. What... Um what, what's kind of caught your eye? You know, you've, you've been around the, um, you know, the trade show scene and, you know, obviously you, uh, you do some awesome content on YouTube and, and um, you Thank know, you. featuring, um, you know, certain pieces of equipment that you're using. But, um, you know, besides like the Alcatronic, what's kind of caught your eye in terms of the equipment out there that's kind of new and different? Are you talking about the ones that's coming out or that's already out? Uh, either one, you know, something that um, is just kind of like hitting the market or, or something in the pipeline. I mean, you know, to you, what's what's kind of standing out? I mean, I think the um, the alkalinity, you know, monitoring and controlling, um, you know, um, pieces of equipment like the Alcatronic and the GHL KH Director and the Trident, those are um, some pretty cool innovations that we've had in this hobby the last uh, few years. And, and uh, you know, I remember back in the day, I would, um, you know, and, and a lot of people still do, you lean on the, uh, the, the hobby grade test kits. Um, yep. And... Uh, I didn't really do that much testing, you know, years and years ago. I was just um, kind of looking at the tank and something looked uh, strange and maybe I would break out the test kits. But I never tested for phosphate. I never tested for magnesium. I tested like alkalinity, calcium, and nitrate. And those are my uh, go-to parameters for testing. But now, you know, we have all the, um, you know, these different tools available um, to us. So yeah. it's, it's interesting. I'll tell you, um, there are a couple of things that kind of caught my eyes uh, like this year. First one, since we're talking about Alcatronic, I think the Mastertronic will be a game changer for me personally. Uh, Mastertronic, for those who may not be familiar, although I feel like most people probably know what it is already, it does not, uh, so it's kind of like a companion piece to Alcatronic. It does not test the uh, alkalinity, but it tests like the calcium, magnesium, phosphate, nitrate. And the phosphate, nitrate are the two that kind of like mind blowing for me. Uh, yeah. I feel like that'll be fantastic. If I were to test my tank, it'll be al alkalinity, calcium nitrate and phosphate. Um, those last two pieces, I started testing a little bit, uh, probably like last year, and realizing that my tank has been starving of the nitrate and phosphate has been a game changer for me. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, the other thing that recently came out, I didn't really look too much into, but I'm excited about, is actually the sand coming out from <laughs> Two Little Fishies. I know it's kind of crazy, but I feel like sand is one of those things that we all, well, a lot of us use, but not too many people look too much into it. Sand, I'm pretty par uh, I'm pretty partial towards reef flakes and mini flake. For those of you who know what it is, uh, you know it's good stuff. Not all the sand are created the same, and I feel like that's not a lot of uh, newcomers into in that niche. So seeing uh, a two little fishy kind of like jumping into it, I saw that they came out two different types of sand. I'm kind of excited to see like what's going on in there. Yeah. He the other thing that I'm interested in is also uh, I saw the Hannah Checkers releasing a nitrate test. And nitrate test has always been uh, kind of like a pain in the butt for me. So that's why I uh, don't enjoy doing it. Phosphate is easy because Hannah Checker, uh, they made it really easy. Nitrate, you always have to do it. You have to wait and then you have to do some more. Uh, the fact that if they can do something similar to the phosphate checker, I think it would be awesome as well. And that kind of goes hands in hands with the Massatronic. You can probably just have one and get away with it, but hey, if you have both, why not? So those three are the things that I'm interested in and looking forward to. Uh, Keith, how about you? I'm kind of curious on your thought as well. You know, I think, um, like I mentioned, the um, the piece of equipment like the Alcatronic and and the um, and the Trident and the GHL cage director and, and the ion director, which is going to be coming out from uh, GHL this fall, to me are really big innovations in the hobby that, um, I think are, um, it, it makes reef keeping easier, but I also think it's important not to go 
too lean too heavily on the technology. I think that um, it's it's a great thing to have. It's a great thing to kind of confirm what you might already know. It's a great way to to track how your tank is doing and to control any deviations that um, need to be uh, adjusted. So um, I think that uh, is certainly stood out to me. Um, we were talking. I can't remember. If we were talking during the show, or we were talking during one of the uh, one of your videos while you and I were just talking ourselves. But um, I'm an old metal halide guy. I've been using metal halides my whole life in my reef tanks, and for my new tank build, I'm going to be using LEDs. And and for me, you know, over the last few years, I think what's been interesting is just the um, the advancements in the LED technology in terms of being able to grow SPS corals and color up SPS corals. So personally, I think that's that's something that um, has kind of caught my eye, and that um, yeah. that's that's really um, a mainstream way of um, of lighting an SPS dominant tank. Um, so you know, I think I think there's a, there's a lot of really cool, neat things out there. Um, but um, yeah, that's that's the fun of the hobby. It's just there, there's just so many different innovations. I mean, there's innovations with uh, with dry rock. You know, we we talked yeah. about. Um, the uh, the bulk reef supply um, tank from Top Shelf Aquatics with the uh, with with the uh, um, Haitian rock and the and the scape with that and and I think what um, Marco Rocks has done with the um, the stack rocks with Julian Sprung stack rocks or or the uh, the shelf rock it's just really cool what you can do with uh, with aquascaping so that's just opened up a whole other uh, area in, in terms of creativity for this hobby that just wasn't really there many, many years ago. Of course, there's um, some things that you have to, um, you know, there's, there's negatives to that as well. It, I've, um, I didn't have the greatest experience cycling my uh, dry rock only tank, but, um, you know, so it's, it's a different approach, but um, it's, it's another alternative, which is great. Yeah. I also wish there's more innovation in terms of, um, okay, so like, I feel like we've pushed the technology side a lot, which is fantastic. Keep pushing. But also wish we can also look back to some of the basic tools that we use, like basic turkey baster, like a drip acclimating, a drip dripper, I guess, acclimating dripper, like basic stuff like that that we use that's a little bit like uh, cheaper. Maybe that's why people don't like focus too much on it. But all these basic tools that we use so often, I wish there would be more innovation there. That would be fantastic. I'd like to have something, and I, I, I think I read about this or heard about this, just a product that would make it easier to feed frozen fish food, uh, you know, and, mm. and um, be able to like leave a tank for a couple of days and just be able to dispense frozen fish food, some cubes easily into a tank. I, there's probably a product out there for that, but. Um, yeah, somebody, somebody was doing it actually. I think it, it may be a Kickstarter or some sort, but there was, um, there was a prototype product out and it looks kind of interesting. I think it's like ID or something like that, but yeah, somebody's working on it, but I feel like that's something that that we need as well. Interesting you mentioned it. It seems like Avos is coming out with a new auto feeder as well. That looks pretty cool. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I drop it. That's like a feeding tube and is there's a pump to make sure the food sinks in first before being released. Oh, nice. I thought that's cool. Yeah, pretty cool. All right, we got uh, we got a question from uh, Dominic Jackson. Um, what products do you recommend for checking salinity? I mean, there's a lot out there you can do uh, for, for salinity. I mean, what do you think, Moki? I like the HANA handheld salinity checker. It's like quick and simple. Um, beyond that, I like the reflectometer. But if I want to be super truthful, I do think that there's a place for swing um, hydrometer as well. Everybody's like, oh, but mine has been really accurate. Um, so it's like different different tools for different folks, whatever you like. I, I Overall, I do think that the HANA salinity checker is probably the simplest. Yeah, I I, um, I use my Proflux 4 to, uh, to check... Um, you know, selenium, that's lab grade, but I also like to use a refractometer just to make sure that, um, you know, it's, um, it's in line, but you know, obviously you, you, yeah. if you have a, a lab grade instrument, you need to, um, be able to, um, you know, check that and calibrate it often to make sure that it's accurate. Um, so Moki, I've got one last general question for you and cause if we're already uh, past the eight o'clock here and I don't want to like, uh, you know, oh, no take your time, yeah, no but, um, so I got one general question and then a couple of rapid fire questions for you. So, um, sure. what to, you know, just this, so for this show, I like, I like it to be very educational and, and I like, you know, to hopefully have some, um, some, um, sage knowledge that, that, uh, you know, we could get, pass along for myself. Oh, and our hold on, hold on. I just said I'm more entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try, I'll try, I'll try. All right. So what, well, think back to your, you know, informational side here. 
put that hat on. Um, what? Really small what? Uh, no, nah, come on, man. I've seen your tanks. You're awesome. So, uh, what would you say are some important lessons that you've learned about keeping reef tanks, and what advice can you pass along, you know, to others based on you know maybe some mistakes that you've made in the past? What? What? What's some advice that you would like to give to um, folks that are thinking about getting the hobby or are struggling with the hobby right now? Okay. Uh, if you have a smaller tank, right, I would almost say that a auto top off is probably, I would dare to say that is almost like a required equipment. It just keep your water so much more stable, especially if a smaller tank. Uh, otherwise just be vigilant in terms of topping off your water because salinity, if it goes like everything goes along with it, just, just watch that. Once you get into more sensitive corals, that is not soft coral, watch your alkalinity elk swing is the number one killer in my tank in my old, old tank every time something goes wrong my alkalinity somehow slip it's either maybe like the uh dosing pump kind of messed up or i kind of messed up or water change maybe maybe you use a new salt that somehow makes that 11 dkh versus the 8.5 you're targeting <laughs> don't ask me how i know uh so i think those are some of the things to kind of watch out for but overall, I'm just going to beat a dead horse and say just be patient. I think like patient is honestly, people people give it as like the number one recommendation for a reason. Yeah, no, that's that's the way I feel too. All right, some uh, some rapid fire questions for you here. What's your, uh, what would you have to say is your favorite coral? Space Invader Pectinia. Nice. It's awesome looking coral. Frog spine. <laughs> okay. A close second. <laughs> a lot. All right. Uh, if I have to pick one, I would say that space and fader. Yeah. What about uh, favorite fish? Oh boy, that's tough. Clownfish. I like clownfish. Clownfish. I like, clownfish. I like, I like clownfish too. Or frogfish. I like frogfish. Clownfish. 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 <laughs> we'll go to the first one. All right. My final rapid fire question: What does your dream tank look like? My dream tank would be a 93-gallon cube because really? I feel like it's, it's a little bit more manageable. Um, I would love for it to be a mixed reef if possible. I know it's tough, but the upper level of it, all SPS. Bottom, we got the LPS providing motions and some softies always lying the bottom. And in that tank, I would like some. I would love to have a emperor angelfish, but I know the tank is too small, so I probably shouldn't say it. Uh, I just want something that's like really colorful, a lot of motions, and a mixed reef, which I know is really difficult to do. I'm tempted to say I want a huge, huge tank in a house. Uh, maybe like maybe the house is surrounded by a tank, and the other side is kind of like halfway under the sea. But just uh, being realistic, I think 93 gallon cube is probably I, my ideal um, dimension. Would the would the wife buy into that much bigger tank? She wants a much bigger oh, tank. Wow, nice. Like when when this tank came in, she's like. I think you can get a much larger tank. I'm like, what? This is good. That's that's a good thing to have that kind of support. Now, my wife yeah, is very supportive of my hobby too. So, um, but, you know, I don't I don't tell her everything. So, <laughs> <laughs> wise man. So, Moki, any uh, any final thoughts here? We'll wrap it up. Um, I say I just want to say thank you, Keith, to you number one for uh, allowing me be on here, and number two for all the people who are tuning in live or just watching it afterwards. It's just fantastic. I'll say uh, in the beginning, I kind of like rushed back home after working out. So I'm just setting everything up. It's kind of a mess. But uh, second half, I kind of like buckle down and just start chatting with friends. I kind of wish I came back home a little bit earlier. So I'm more in the right mindset to really hang out with you guys. But uh, once again, thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's been a blast. Hey, man, I really enjoyed having you. Hopefully you'll uh, you'll come back and, and we can chat again, man. It's It was my pleasure to have you on. And, and uh, I'll be uh, I'll be checking out your videos and your Instagram stuff. It's uh, always very engaging content to follow. And, and maybe if we ever have uh, some trade shows again, I'll see you at one of those. <laughs> hey, you know, um, I think Magna is doing it online this year, right? There's yeah, that's like a, right. Phoenix like a virtual. You think about it? That'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll see you virtually if you, uh, if you decide yeah. to Are check you it out. Do it? I think so. I think so. All yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. I have to check that out. I'm um, just looking to see if we have any more uh, comments here. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. All right, man. I think that's a wrap. So um, anyway, that's going to do it for the show. Again, my sincere thanks to, uh, to Moki. I really appreciate it, man, for you being on the live stream. And my next live stream is going to be uh, next Thursday, July 23rd, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And my guest will be uh, Carlos Chacon from Coral View. So that'll be a um, oh nice that'll be that'll fun be one. a really cool show and looking forward to that. So 
until then, everybody, be safe, be well, and, uh, and uh, adios.